name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So there's a folk tale in India that goes something like this. There was a wise and beloved king who had three daughters. And he gathered his daughters together and he says, I have to go on a long journey. I am looking for God. I need to get deeper in my relationship with God. And I don't know when I'll be back. But I leave you a gift. And he departed and each of the three daughters at different times, opened the gift. It was the same gift. It was a singular grain of rice. So the first daughter opened the gift, and she tied a gold thread around it, and she put it in a box. And every day, she would start the day by opening the box and thinking about her father and smiling. She would close each night the same way. And she treasured that grain of rice as a sacrament of her dad's love for her. The second daughter opened the gift and, and felt like it was somewhat of a trick and discarded the grain of rice. What use is this? And the third opened it and pondered and revisited it again uh, day after day until she decided to plant it. She planted it and it grew a field of rice uh, and after some significant time, the father returned. The king returned. And he came and he listened to the first daughter who showed uh, the grain of rice. And he kindly smiled without much response. Even to the second who had discarded, the gentle father understood and nodded but didn't have much of a response. And then before he could even find out what the third child had done, he looked out the window and saw the field of rice and he says to the daughter, you have fed my village, you've fed my people, you've taken my gift, and you've shared it. And he made her the queen. Today is one of my favorite days of the year in the church. I love the baptism of our Lord because I think it affirms what drove me to the priesthood, what affirms me each week as we gather as the body of Christ, and that is that the incarnation is God in every step of human life. When Jesus entered the waters of baptism, we're reminded that he didn't just become human to get a better view, to get a better vantage point of our life. He entered life so that he could live and walk and exist amongst all the things that make our life full, that make our life heartbreaking, that make our life joyous, that make our life ours, human. The whole aspect of Jesus entering the Jordan is an act of grace. It's entirely unnecessary, which is what grace is. Jesus didn't need to be baptized. Baptism in that time uh, was, was sort of like taking a shower to get the dirt off. Uh, and people were being baptized by John because John said, this guy's coming and he's going to purify our church. He's going to make it right again. So they were getting baptized because he was coming. So why does Jesus need to be baptized? I ask myself that question each year. Because he takes on all of the human condition as those waters that now bear all the sins of all the people that have tried to wash themselves clean again and again. He's in there with it. All of the sorrows of our life, he's in there as they lap against his chest. He is amidst everything that life has thrown at us. Addiction, suffering. I was reminded in my second year as a priest, as right before this Sunday, uh, the tsunamis uh, ripped through our brothers and sisters' homeland, taking so many lives and leaving such havoc that Jesus was in the water. Years later, is uh, right before this season, we were touring Cleveland, uh, and we were on a boat going around uh, the Cuyahoga River, and we heard about how it had caught fire, and I thought about all of the things that we've done to our earth, that we've done to one another, all of the pollution of the sins that were washed out in the river, and Jesus in the midst of all of that. A couple years after that, on this same occasion, a woman wanted me to baptize her daughter, and as we were getting ready for the baptism, she brought me uh, a little bit of the, of the River Jordan, a little vial with the water. And I thought about it as I poured it into the baptismal font. I thought all of the water 
The water that poured down last night as, as water evaporates and comes back to earth, all of the water that Jesus stepped into has fallen on our heads, has been in our drinking water, has been part of our lives. Jesus enters so fully into the human condition that every experience that we have is enmeshed with it. But Luke goes even a step farther. He doesn't just focus on the baptism. He asks, what's next? If you notice in Luke, unlike the other Gospels that we read each year at this particular date, Luke doesn't actually mention Jesus' baptism. And one of the things that uh, a good preacher warns is that whenever the church leaves out a couple verses in the Gospel, make sure to go and read those verses. That might be where the meat is. It might be where the difficult part is. And if you go, the part that's missing, you'll notice it says you know, verses this to this, and then skips, and then verses this to this. Is John arrested? It doesn't even mention that John baptized Jesus. We get that from the other Gospels, and I don't think Luke was trying to, uh, to contradict that. But it paired right up against baptism, reminds us that baptism has cost. It also begins a new chapter in Luke's, in Luke's story. All the heralding in, the heralding in of the prophets, the heralding in of John is given way, and now is, is Jesus' time to do his work. And then the next transition will be our time to do our work. And we have the, the book of Acts beyond that. One of the things that Luke reminds us of is it's not just about the baptism uh, that, Jesus, that God is well pleased with. That it's not actually in the baptism in Luke's story uh, that the skies open up and, and God descends down and says, This is my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. It is afterwards when Jesus goes to pray. The work that we do after today. The way that we truly seek and serve Christ in one another, the way that we truly respect the dignity of every human being, the way that we live out of this gift, this identity, the spirit of adoption, is what matters to God. We are God's beloved, God's children, but that's a gift that we are meant to share with others. Martin Luther describes it this way. Any stone that has basked in the sun of the midday still gives heat during the darkness of night. But through our baptism, through our participation in the life of the church, we are meant not just to radiate heat, but to give that heat to others amidst the coldness of life. But we claim something each time we baptize. We claim something for Finley, who's about to be baptized, and we claim something for ourselves, our identity with another story. Fred Craddock, one of the great preachers of the 20th century, uh, in his collection of stories, writes about uh, being in a, in, in a, in a, in a cafe in uh, the Smoky Mountains, um, and he describes having coffee with his wife, and into the little cafe, uh, an elderly man notices who he is, and he walks up to him, and he says, I want to share a story with you. Um, and he starts to talk about his childhood in the rural part of Tennessee, and he says, you know, my mom was a single mom in a time where that was a no-no in a place where this was absolutely something that would make you a pariah. He said, my mom's sins were cast onto me and I sat in the cafeteria alone. He said, I remember in elementary school and middle school sitting there eating my lunch alone because of something that I had no choice in. And he said, at some point I decided I wanted to go to church. So he describes in high school walking to church, but he made a careful point of leaving before anybody uh, could tell him that he had no business being in church. He would leave right before the end, uh, and so he'd be well out the door before the minister greets people and, uh, and people start to mill around and ask questions. He remembers one Sunday, he didn't get out fast enough, and the minister put his hand on his shoulder and he looked him in the eye, and he knew what that was because it happened a lot of times. They're trying to figure out who his dad might have been. They're looking at him, and he says, you're... He realized he didn't know whose son he was. But then he stops. He looked at him again. He looked him in the eye, and he said, you are the son of God. You are God's child. There's a striking resemblance. Go live out of your inheritance. He said that was day one. So that's the moment he realized that he was somebody, the moment he realized whose he was, 
He said that moment changed his life forever. As they finished their conversation, Fred Craddock asked him his name. And he said, Ben Hooper. And he'd heard that name before. And it wasn't until uh, a while later uh, that he realized that Ben Hooper was the two-time governor of Tennessee. That moment had given him a sense of whose he was. That he was God's child. God's beloved, with whom I am well pleased. It's not just about our baptism. It's not just about the gifts we've been given. It's about how we claim them and what we do with them. And as we claim them for Finley, I hope we claim them deeply in our own lives. Because it's how we walk out of this, out of this place. How we walk out of this truth that defies us. Amen.